Our next guest is interesting on both counts. Our next guest has a wide range of experience in many areas of life. His life is fascinating. I have often enjoyed over the last several years hearing the stories that he tells. Some of them are very raise your eyebrows of his experiences. I've often suggested to him that he should write his autobiography. It would be fascinating reading, which is probably why he says he'll never do it. <laughs> For those of you who are involved in home education, uh, you'd be interesting to know that Otto Scott is a largely self-taught man, and yet no man is more educated than he. One of his special qualities is his candor. In a time when candor is not appreciated and saying what others would think you ought to say is, is considered a, a quality, Otto Scott says what he feels and what he believes and what he thinks ought to be said. His thoughts are always relevant, his words are always thought-provoking, and he always gives a perspective, a larger picture than we often see. His books are varied, involved in business, corporate history, biography, but his ability to provide a larger picture, a larger perspective, has made him well qualified to analyze the thoughts, the trends, and the follies of our modern culture. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce Otto Scott. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate that introduction from Mark kind words from somebody that you respect are very valued. It occurred to me as I was listening to the previous speakers that I'm the only non-minister to address you, and therefore my remarks will probably be somewhat less overtly theological but I can assure you that they have a theological foundation. When we Christians once again take command of society and civilization, we shall make a great many changes. Changes in manners, changes in education, changes in language. And one of the words that we are going to change in terms of definition and acceptance is the word revolution. Revolution is a word used today to describe the most trivial of things, somebody who revolutionizes an office process, revolutionary new toothpaste. <laughs> And, of course, revolution is also used to describe the most terrible of human events in modern times, the French or the Russian or the Chinese or the Cambodian or the Nicaraguan or the Cuban revolution. Now, I'd like to make in the course of these two talks a distinction between the word revolution and the word change. They're not the same. They're often confused. And when it's, I hope today to define the changes between those two so that the Christian Reconstruction Movement will be able to discern the difference between revolutionaries and those of us who want to change this civilization from a godless one headed for revolution to a Christian one headed for change. Let's begin, therefore, with the cost of revolution. Webster's unabridged second edition 
definition of cost is loss of any kind, detriment, deprivation, suffering. All these are terms that modern history repeatedly validates when it comes to revolution. I say modern history because all history is replete with descriptions of revolutions through the centuries. The effort to overthrow one ruling class and install, and install a different one is as old as civilization itself. But we only have time for the highlights of what Prince Kropotkin calls the Great Revolution, which set the pattern and the language and the arguments with which we are today still struggling, the French Revolution. What caused it? Students are told that it was caused by poverty, but that's not even a half an answer, and it's certainly not a true one. It was the event which occurred in the richest nation in the world. France was the world's cultural leader, the world's leader in science, in manufacturing, in industry, in diplomacy. It had the richest upper class and the largest middle class. It had the greatest population in Europe, 25 million to England's 5 million and the United States is 4 million. Spain, 9 million. There was no Germany because the German states, fragmented, had not yet been unified. There was no Italy where the same situation prevailed. All governments, said young Thomas Jefferson, derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. In France, that consent was not recognized. The king was absolute, and the nobility, which had once protected the people from absolute centralized power, had been corrupted into courtiers, lobbyists for their own interests. The middle class was educated and prosperous, could build homes and buy horses and carriages, but had no political voice of its own. Power, say the scientists, flies into a vacuum. The political vacuum in France led to the growth of a new sort of power, the power of the press, the power of art, the power of the stage, of novels, of oratory, of agitation, and this power, with its thousands of voices, grew over at least two generations. Its campaign held religion to be irrational and fraudulent compared to the realism of science and politics. In this view, it was not God who was important, but a concept called human rights and progress. I can just see progress flapping ahead of everybody, invisible angel. It was not that conditions were terrible. France had many times endured worse conditions and poorer harvest than in 1788. The fact of the matter was that France was growing richer and not poorer. The governmental de deficit was high but it could have been handled because France was very rich. There were huge resources in the nation. The people were richer than the government. What was needed was a participatory political system that could create and apply solutions to their problems. And all France had was an absolute king who was kindly but incompetent a nobility that had become trivial, a clergy that had lost its way, and the judiciary that represented people of goodwill with antique laws. They were all in favor of reform, provided it didn't cost them personally anything. They were 
Meanwhile, it was their expensive privileges and tax exemptions, combined with a stupid and extravagant foreign policy, that created the deficit and put the national budget out of balance. If the crown and the church and the nobility had the common sense to stop making things worse and had brought in new minds to help make things better, the revolution would have been averted. But that would have meant sharing political power, and very few ruling groups have ever voluntarily taken that step. There was one other important cultural aspect that's worth mentioning. The ruling class of France had become liberal, which meant that they confused words with reality. As long as they verbally agreed that human rights were important, they didn't have to change what they were doing. And the king, a liberal, agreed with the need for change, but didn't understand that a period of violence had arrived. And, of course, overall, the governing class had lost its faith. The new United States, or the constitutional monarchy of Britain, was admired and recommended. But no culture can live according to the politics of another, except in the most general sense any more than an individual can live another's life. All challenges are personal and individual and have transcendental meaning. And France had lost sight of God. You know the rest. What did the French Revolution cost? Well, first, the internal terror. The National Assembly began to establish inquiries and reduced the tax privileges and the situation of the nobility and the clergy. Then they replaced the judiciary with committees inside the National Assembly, which began to confiscate property for past offenses, and then finally to issue death sentences. This was a remarkable event. It marked the first time in the history of the world that any government in a time of peace had condemned its own citizens to death, not for what they were doing, but for the social status that they had previously held. Individuals, in other words, were not regarded as individuals individually responsible, but as representatives of a class, the guillotine was activated, sliced off the heads in the end of more commoners than nobles, because the revolution has always turned into a dog-eat-dog -dog mess. First the leaders killed each other, and then one another's followers. Most historians stop with that and go on to Napoleon. But Napoleon was part of the revolution. He continued it in terms of Europe, and the cost of that revolution in his hands was 20 years of war and millions of lives. Not just France, but all Europe and even Russia paid for the arguments that the French had inside their own house. Men died in battle, in cold, in starvation, and from disease. Families were ruined, women widowed and children orphaned, farms were left untended, factories destroyed, villages, towns, and cities were stripped. Nor was that all. The revolution was against large estates, and France was broken up into individual plots that spread ownership very widely. This kept France, the French agriculture, backward to this day. The revolution was against the rich and included in that category manufacturers and industrialists who were handicapped by special restrictive regulations. For over a century, French industrialization lagged behind Great Britain at first and then Germany and the United States later. French living standards lagged behind these other nations and France fell from the number one spot in the world 
to a very poor form. Its intellectual standing fell correspondingly. All it retained of its former international glory was top rank in women's fashion and in vice. All the glowing and wonderful words about progress and equality ended up in wrecked lives, a permanent depression, a huge underclass, a falling birth rate that has never recovered, a crippled church, and arguments between left and right that continue to this day. In other words, the catastrophe was agricultural, industrial, political, intellectual, and religious. It broke, for all time, the famous vitality that had made France the scientific, cultural, industrial, and commercial leader of all Europe. And what is worse is that the French Revolution never really stopped. There was an uprising in 1830 and a coup d'etat in 1851. Defeat in 1870 and another terror in 1871. Defeat and occupation by the Germans in 1940. And a new constitution every generation. Nor was that all. All Europe picked up the revolutionary pattern, and we have seen it in the Orient, in Africa, and in Latin America. Its rhetoric and its promises were so glittering and so attractive that nation after nation has succumbed to its lure. When I wrote about the French Revolution, I didn't even dare quote what the leaders said, lest my readers be seduced from the facts by their eloquence. A great incalculable cost of the revolution was that it converted the intellectuals from religion to politics, from the transcendental, from the internal God to the God of immediate power. Revolutionary rhetoric flowed all through the West all through the 19th century and into our own time. In the 19th century, the socialists of Germany rose to carry the banner of the revolution among the intellectuals. Karl Marx was hired by revolutionary refugees from the French Revolution to continue their work. The League of the Just, how do you like that for a name, was founded by men who fled from Napoleon. And they used, of course, new words. Socialism replaced the word revolution, but the goal was the same, to replace the ruling class. In every area where political rights were denied, in Russia, in the German and Italian states, in the Ottoman Empire, in Austria, the French Revolution remained the model. And that model contained two important elements. One was the creation of an all-powerful legislative body with unlimited authority based on the French National Assembly under Robespierre, claiming to speak in the name of the people. And the other was the use of force in the name of human rights. The United States was not immune to these ideas because we're a part of the West. We belong to the same civilization as Europe. The abolitionists believe that force is a righteous, in a righteous cause is just. And this imitation of the French revolutionaries helped create a terrible civil war in this land a war that cost over 600,000 dead and a million casualties when we had only 40 million people. At the end of that war, our abolitionist Congress determined to continue its drive for equality and to expand its authority by creating new laws that violated the separation of powers. The Tenure in Office Act 
forbade the president to dismiss a cabinet officer without the consent of the Senate. When, sec when President Johnson dismissed Secretary of War Stanton without that permission, Congress said the president has broken the law, and they impeached him for that. And many forget that Andrew Johnson was convicted. He was found guilty by the majority of the Senate. He was saved from being physically removed from office by only one vote. And after that political triumph, he lost his moral authority as president. The Senate and Congress had proven it could override anything that he wanted to do. And the abolitionist Congress reigned supreme. It sent federal courts to occupy the South, federal troops rather, three years after the war was over in the name of human rights. So revolution already occurred here. We had a war of independence from Great Britain, which was a change. But a revolution which overthrew a ruling class occurred in 1868 because the South was ruled out of political participation by an imperial congress. You might call that the Second American Republic. By the end of the 19th century, the Socialist International and its ideas had captured the intellectuals of Europe and the United States. In this period, the late Victorian period, I compare it to the Second Enlightenment, suffused with hatred for Christianity and the clergy, the nobility and monarchy. When the ancien regime of Europe blundered into World War I, the conditions were once again ripe for revolution, a second French revolution, this time launched in defeated Russia in 1917. Now, a little common sense could have averted that. If Germany had agreed to a peace in 1916, if England had agreed to a peace in 1916, the Tsar would have remained on the throne. Nothing in particular would have happened. But England was aware that we could be drawn in. It was going to fight until the Americans came. Peace was rejected. And we entered the war. Germans, of course, made equal mistakes. They outraged our sense of decency by using submarine warfare against civilians. And we got in, and by the time we were all through, Lenin had his revolution. The revolution in Russia repeated the French pattern as precisely as a choreographed ballet. The Tsar, like Louis XVI, was surrounded by a liberal nobility that wanted reforms as long as it didn't have to pay for them. It, the Russians ignored the old believers. They failed to reform the tax structure. They failed to change a failing foreign policy in time. Have you ever noticed that people who consider themselves successful never admit error? After the Tsar abdicated, the Russian Duma, their parliament, set about imitating the French National Assembly. The Social Democrat leaders put the moderates in jail in the name, of course, of freedom. Then the socialists began a great power struggle amongst each other. And in the end, Lenin and Trotsky and Stalin, all creatures of the Socialist International, took over. And they launched, launched a terror that has never ended, despite what is said in the press. If we add to the cost of the Soviet Revolution, the cost of the Chinese and other Asiatic revolutions, as well as the German Revolution, revolutions in Africa and in Latin America, and of course we must put them all together in terms of cost, the total of human debt due to revolution 
is estimated at 160 million persons. On a per capita basis, the revolution has proven 20 times more deadly than war. Communism alone has killed more people than perished in all the wars since 1740. Hitler, who led socialism in one country and who is now a devil figure, mainly for his murder of the Jews, murdered more than Jews. Dr. R.J. Rummel estimates that in addition to four and a half million Jews, Hitler also murdered two and a half million Poles, three million Ukrainians, 1.4 million Belarusians, three million Russian prisoners of war, and nearly half a million gypsies, about 17 million all told. Stalin killed many more, and so did Mao Zedong. But we cannot limit the cost of revolutions to death alone, because death means the end of earthly troubles, and the costs of revolution appear to be eternal, at least endless. One of the goals of the Russian Revolution was to destroy the rich and take away their mansions and estates, and the result was to destroy Russian agriculture. Another was to destroy all reason for people to work. Russian commerce collapsed, and it today lives by forced labor, ranging from outright slave camps to forced labor in factories, offices, and services on the part of all citizens, because no one there is allowed to work at what he wants to work at. He works at what he is told to work at. That's forced labor. Left on its own, the Russian Revolution would have collapsed, much as Robespierre's rule collapsed, as a result of its own stupidity, had it not been for American sentimentality. Herbert Hoover saved Russia from starvation. American businessmen saved the Russian government from commercial and industrial collapse. And between the two, the government of Lenin was able to survive. American businessmen in Moscow and St. Petersburg in 1917 were at first shocked that private property was being wiped out in Russia. But they weren't Russians. Their property wasn't involved. And once they realized that they could do business with the Soviet government, the race was on. And it has never stopped. Today, there are 600 American firms with offices in Moscow, and Americans pleading with Soviet officials to be allowed to provide them with American goods on American credit. Our government buys food from our grain merchants and resells it to the Soviet Union on credit. At interest levels, below what they charge us on terms that are seldom if ever met. Gorbachev wants more. He wants outright grants and he wants the Soviet Union to be given most favored nation status. The State Department has recommended that that be done. Now that's just a detail. The subject is so large that we can barely stay within reasonable limits. Our founding generation saw the French Revolution, and the Russian Revolution should not have surprised our grandfathers or our fathers. After all, they watched the Mexican Revolution right next door, which began in 1910 and lasted for a full ten years. That revolution cost Mexico over two million lives and ruined half the country. It began when Mexico was just entering the industrial age and the revolutionaries claimed that the nation was being looted. When it ended, half the property of all Mexico was destroyed. The revolution was against large estates, excepting those owned by its own leaders, and when it ended, Mexican agriculture was ruined. 
The revolution promised to bring down the rich and kept that promise, except for its leaders. The revolution promised to keep out foreigners, and it did, and ended Mexican industrialization. The revolution made Mexico a basket case. It left Mexico with the first communist rev constitution ever drawn up and a one-party government. American tourists have been traveling in and out of Mexico for the last 68 years, and hardly any of them have discovered that Christianity is officially outlawed in that land, that priests and nuns are forbidden to wear religious clothes, that the church is forbidden to own property, or that religious massacres have been taking place intermittently there ever since 1914. All through this period, Mexico has been paying the cost of revolution and seems destined to continue paying it into the foreseeable future. And the previous speakers have talked of judgment. These are judgments. Nor is that all. The year 1901 marked the beginning of the 20th century, just as the year 2001 will mark the start of the 21st, 12 years from now. When we talk about revolution in this century, we're not simply talking about the fall of kings and emperors and shahs and sultans. We're talking about the fall of hundreds of millions of people, homeowners, proprietors, lawyers, judges, clergymen, artists, and their wives, mechanics, laborers, farmers catapulted out of their land, in all cases, mostly through no fault of their own. It isn't governments that fall alone in revolution. Everybody falls. Throughout this entire century, from 1917 until now and prior to that, from the 1790s until now, in one area after another, the revolution has destroyed institutions as well as people, and the assumptions of centuries of learning have been collapsed with them. The idea of universal education leading to a more intelligent and peaceful population, for instance, was turned inside out by the French Revolution, by the German Revolution under Hitler, the most educated country in the world was reduced intellectually to a level below the savage. But the French, they introduced control of all schools, all school children, all teachers and all textbooks, all lessons and all schedules. All of France learned from the same books at the same time in the same way. And the idea was to dominate the mind of all citizens, to indoctrinate in the name of education. The results have been to spread disinformation and ignorance beyond all former dimensions, to create millions who are taught fables in the name of facts, theories in the name of realities, obedience in the name of individuality, intolerance in the name of justice, envy in the name of right. The intellectual and social costs of revolution, therefore, are beyond measuring, beyond comparison with previous periods, earlier times, or precedents in history. Orwell, disillusioned, did not experience God's grace and therefore was never converted, but he looked at the illusions of revolutionaries with a certain clarity. And after watching Soviet agents murder men during the Spanish Civil War, he wrote a book about how the revolution destroyed language and history. First, he said, it erases all traditional terms of respect. Then it introduces new definitions of old words. Peace, for instance, becomes synonymous with the victory of the revolution. Exploit means to hire someone and pay them to work. Profit means to steal. Riches are proofs of theft and so on. New speak, he called it, and he equated it with a simplification of language. 
It was actually more like a jargon, such as is underway by revolutionaries today who call themselves social scientists, who refer to our brothers and sisters as siblings, love of one's mother as the Oedipus complex, perversion as alternative lifestyles, and so forth. Newspeak, Orwell said, leads people so far away from traditional language that they no longer recognize or relate to it, and that means that they are unable to read or to understand history. If you want to know why our public schools no longer teach history, but are heavy on teaching social science, Compare our graduates with the graduates of nations that have passed through revolutionary fires, such as Cuba or the Black Republics of Africa, and you'll begin to understand how refined and how automatic the process has become. Then you will realize why and how our public educational standards have fallen to the third world levels. One result is a coarse and vulgar literature Film and stage productions replete with terms once confined to the illiterate and the gutter. Nothing is left to the imagination because without proper vocabulary and a knowledge of the world's great literature and traditions, the audience cannot perceive, has no words for honor, no concept of ethics, no yardsticks of evaluation. Even politics becomes progressively degraded. The office of the President of the United States today is traduced in a manner no other nation can equal. Moscow radio shortwave broadcasts routinely articles from the New York Times without change to demonstrate to the world our low level. When our scientists cannot discover, they concoct. The laws of libel are suspended. Congress seeks to emulate the National Assembly and amputate, cut off the head of the body politic, and to rule with unlimited authority over every aspect of our lives. Any sign of life in the body politic calls for a hearing by Congress. The revolution sought first to replace faith in God by faith in the state, as Dr. Kelly mentioned. Then it has destroyed faith in the state by destroying faith in everything the state fails to provide. Now people throughout the world no longer believe in education, no longer believe in work, no longer believe in each other, no longer believe in representative government. The belief in democracy is fading in this country. These are all costs of revolution, and we are paying them, because what is happening among us has its precedent elsewhere. In every spiritual and intellectual detail, the descent of France and Russia and Germany and other nations into the abyss has provided the template by which you can understand the event and the progression of events in the United States. These are all the results of the conversion of the intellectuals to the gods of revolution. And that is what lies beneath our otherwise incomprehensible foreign policy, our educational system, our trivial, parasitic, ancien regime, and our social difficulties. After World War II, this government embarked on a policy of giving or lending, mostly giving, money to governments around the world. Hamilton Fish, whom I talked to when he was 94, he's now 100, Famous congressman, only old people now remember that, a war hero, leader of black troops in World War I, opponent of Franklin Roosevelt and also one of his social class, asked me about four or five years ago why it was that Congress has never held a hearing on who handled all the billions of dollars that have flowed from our nation to the rest of the world. Don't you suppose some banker's nephew received a commission, he asked, but of course the question had a deeper meaning. Who persuaded whom to give away those millions, those billions? You may think that's another subject, but it isn't. 
For all the revolutions mounted since 1917 around the world have been funded with American money. The Bolsheviks, the Cubans, the Nicaraguans, the Chinese, the Cambodians, the black African nations. We are funding the revolution today in South Africa, in Latin America, South America, and at home. Our foreign aid expenditures add up almost precisely to the size of our national deficit. It wasn't welfare at home. It was welfare around the globe that brought us into the red ink. Can you imagine how prosperous we would be if we had used our own resources to help our own people and our own commerce, our own industry? How strong we would be? How safe we would be? The cost of revolution, therefore, involves us as well as the nations that I have discussed. Revolution has impoverished us as well as the people directly involved. The death, the suffering, the disease and the destruction, the shortages and the retrogression of our civilization that shrivels our lives and our prospects as definitely as they have narrowed our world and are imperiling our stability and insecurity we are paying these costs. Nor is that all. One of the greatest and least mentioned consequences of revolution from the French occasion until now has been the disillusion that it has brought to the world and to our civilization. Every promise of the revolution to eliminate social injustice, to bring peace, to more equitably distribute the goods of the world, to introduce merit instead of privilege, to improve the lot of all, to educate everyone to everyone's potential, to bring happiness to every life and satisfaction to every pursuit has proven false. The revolutionary promise to expand political power in particular has proven to be a lie. In every instance, without exception, the revolutions that have imitated the French have created a newer and smaller elite at the top and made an underclass out of everyone else. The great promise of a society ruled by a legislature, by a group of high-minded, idealistic leaders, have been successively made ridiculous by the subservient Soviet Congresses and their ridiculous equivalents. I needn't tell you about our Congress, 98% of whom are cemented into office and who are now intent upon becoming a revolutionary and unlimited body of leaders. I have described what happens to you when legislatures escape the chief, the chief executive and the people, how far they run. And I need not remind you that Intellectuals today glory in our new enlightenment, which is campaigning against Christianity and the clergy, against traditional values in favor of unlimited license, which wants to tax the rich as though their properties were illegally obtained, and through the media and an iron triangle of educators, journalists, and politicians has effectively denied political influence to the American majority and is leading us into the same swamp as their predecessors around the world. In terms of the costs of revolution, therefore, we're not onlookers or bystanders. We're not different. We are in the position of John Donne, who lived at a time when the church bells used to toll for the dead. Every time there was a funeral, the bells would ring. Any man's death, he said, diminishes me because I am involved in mankind, and therefore never seek to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. But I cannot, of course, leave the matter there. I really didn't come here simply to depress you. <laughs> there is hope on the horizon. We are still alive. The bells are not tolling for us. We're able to move as well as talk and to act as well as think. And this afternoon, I will tell you, now that we've talked about revolution, I will tell you about change.
and how we will accomplish it. Thank you very much.